Welcome everyone to our week two study of the Holocaust. Week one, we studied Jewish persecution from 1933 to 1939, which is basically Nazi-controlled pre-war Germany. Hitler comes to power in 1933, and the war will begin in September 1st, 1939. This persecution was primarily the denial of civil liberties, the denial of jobs, uh, the denial of movement, property, citizenship, with sporadic violence uh, thrown in more as a terror weapon. If you look at the po Jewish populations, and you can see on the map behind me of Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia, the total Jewish populations of Nazi-controlled Germany are relatively small. Matter of fact, it is w less than 1% of the total population of Nazi-controlled territories. Once Germany invades Poland in 1939 uh, and the Soviet Union the, uh, in 1940, you can see that the Jewish populations of Poland, Romania, and the Soviet Union are very high. Poland has 3 million, the Soviet Union has 2.5 million, and Romania at a million. The policies that were put in place for pre-war Nazi Germany were not going to work in Poland, the Soviet Union, and Romania. The Jewish question needed a different answer. And the Nazis chose as their solution to the Jewish question the Einsatzgruppen, or mobile killing squads. As you can see, the photograph behind me has changed uh, to show you what the Nazi solution was. It was quite simply to go to town to town and kill the Jews by rifle, shooting them into pits, covering them up, and moving to the next town. The video you're about to watch with me is that story. It's the story of the Einsatzgruppen, sometimes called the Hidden Holocaust, and sometimes called the Holocaust of Bullets. This killing will go on until the end of World War II and claim over two million lives. The shooting operations were very much in-your-face killings. They were not by remote control the way gas chamber killing operations were. In terms of record keeping, the Einsatzgruppen had instructions to keep statistics on the number of people that they shot not only the number of Jews, but also the number of communists and insurgents, as they called them, or agitators or resistors that they shot. This document shows a map of the Baltic states and Belarus with coffins, one coffin in each country as well as a number next to the coffin, which designates the number of Jews killed in that particular region in the middle of January, 
I encountered the story of the Einsatzgruppen in the course of reading about human violence, which is something my work has focused on as an historian and a writer. The fact is, to read about the Holocaust in any of its aspects is to be traumatized. I had nightmares, I had a great difficulty dealing with this material. Ultimately, what moved me to push through those feelings and tell this story was that these victims had never really been celebrated. Their story had never really been told. And even more terribly, I think, the general belief of historians is that, that the death camps were the center of the story that the Einsatzgruppen killings generally have been shrugged off as wild excesses of the SS, which to me basically means that those historians also really didn't want to confront this material. Okay, so what you're going to discover here and what they're going to reveal to you is that the Einsatzgruppen um, really is the first attempt by Nazi Germany to exterminate the Jewish population. And you would have never heard of death camps and they would have never existed if this worked uh, to kill that many people. Um, it didn't. It was, for reasons they will explain in this video, this system of going from town to town uh, wasn't fast enough. It wasn't efficient enough. Um, so the Einsatzgruppen had to be replaced with something else. And eventually what it's going to be replaced with are the death camps like Treblinka, Sobibor, uh, and Auschwitz. Remberg, die Stadt zeigt Spuren schwersten Kampfes. Die ukrainische Bevölkerung the Einsatzgruppen massacres preceded the invention of the death camps. When the German army invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, the Einsatzgruppen followed behind the army, ostensibly to pacify the civilians when the army moved on. But part of their program was to murder Jews. And the idea of mass industrialized killing really hadn't come up yet. Das Judenviertel von Jona war, das gleichfalls nach dieser Anordnung verschont wurde, wird gesäubert. Auch hier terrorisierte das jüdische Gesindel im Bunde mit den GPU-Agenten die litauische Bevölkerung in der furchtbarsten Weise. Institutionally, to put it in a nutshell, the Einsatzgruppen were essentially mobile offices of the Reich Main Office for Security, responsible for a region and would move with the advance of German troops, pacifying and securing an area until such time as reinforcements arrived for the Germans to really begin implementing some of their longer term race and settlement plans. People kill every day, several times a week, entire communities, no end. On to the next one. They don't seem to tire, they don't seem to slack, and they're relentless about it. They're also not satiated by the blood that they have spilled. Let's go to the next place. More. No satisfaction, no end.
There were four Einsatzgruppen. The largest, which was Einsatzgruppe A, consisted of about 900 personnel, of whom maybe half were actual police officers, and the remainder were support personnel, truck drivers, clerks, uh, paymasters. Uh, the locals provided the rest of the manpower. Generally, the ratio of German nationals to locals was probably about 60-40 in the major operations and then, of course, much less in these initial operations where there were fewer German personnel on hand. So what they're telling you there is that as these Einzon group and these four large groups of soldiers with support staff moved through Poland and the Soviet Union, um, they actually didn't have enough people with them to carry out these mass killings and had to rely on local support so this gives you an idea of the anti-Semitism that existed not only in Germany, but also in Poland and the Soviet Union, that enough locals were, a, were willing to help out in these mass executions. And what you have to remember is these are small towns. Uh, the locals that are helping out know the victims. Um, the shootings happened in thousands and thousands of locations. Um, all over Eastern Europe. Uh, there is a uh, Catholic priest, Father Dubois, who has uncovered over 2,000 of these killing sites, uh, with many more yet to be unearthed, if ever. Um, so this system, the Einsongruppen, also relied on the anti-Semitism that already existed in Eastern Europe. They had their hands full. They were killing hundreds of thousands of people, one bullet at a time. You had to have a pit dug, you had to gather the people together. It took time, it was trouble. They had a terrible logistics problem. So the Einsatzgruppen specifically preceded the death camps and were, in my judgment, as a historian who's looked very carefully at the record, the reason for the invention of the death camps. They're going to take a look at one town in particular, and they do a really neat thing with these photographs of Jewish people within the town. Um, these are all pictures of Jews within this town. And they'll go back to that town and they take a picture in the same spot the original photograph was taken. And they fade one out and bring in the modern uh, picture um, to symbolically show the removal of the Jews. Um, that you get the sense of all the people in these photographs have been permanently removed.
Let me go through the steps how this had to happen. Bear in mind that the Jews in a given area were usually concentrated well before in a specific section of town, or if it was from the countryside and the smaller towns into the largest town around. They had identified the Jews in advance, pulled them all into the town center, and again, they were careful not to let anyone really know what the end result was going to be as much as they could until it was too late. They would be marched up to the edge after they were made naked. In most cases, we know because we have diagrams of the killing, Two or three or four people would shoot people, normally in the back. And the reason you had two or three or four or five is essentially so that none of the killers had an individual responsibility. I don't know if it's my bullet that killed if I'm a killer or somebody else's. They were shot usually by security police and SD personnel, sometimes volunteers from among the auxiliaries were sought and they were involved doing the shooting as well. After the men were gone, then they went after the women and children. The fiendish thinking behind this strategy was that if they'd killed the women and children first, the men would be more likely to fight because they'd have nothing left to lose. And then another layer of people would be shot. Once the pit was filled to capacity, it would be covered over uh, after another layer of soil was put on, layer of lime, and then uh, topsoil would be covered. Now, this is very interesting because the nature of the Einzongruppen, um, there are, aren't survivors. Uh, it would be like trying to interview a survivor of the gas chambers. Um, if you went into the gas chamber, you died. In this case, uh, we do have a survivor. I'm sure there was others as well that were able to do what this man did or young boy did. Um, but he's able to survive it, uh, and he's going to tell his story. Of course, today he is an old man uh, retelling a story of him being a child. He is speaking English, though it is broken, uh, so they do include subtitles for you. But he is going to tell the story of his experience with the Einzongruppen. And his experience is basically followed a procedure of how these mass executions work. Uh, I was with a hundred people. And then here was on the left side. I am left on a neighbor. Me. My father. My brother, Shmuel Pekovsky, there's five people in this line. And we saw a bone of clothing in front of us from the previous groups. A German was sitting knee, eh, one foot at the other, a machine gun. On his knee. I'm pointed not on us, but on the pitch. We were meanwhile undressing. I saw my father naked. I saw all the neighbors naked. Myself, I didn't see. My brother. And my brother, he didn't look at me, he didn't look at nobody. He was putting his face on my father's leg. Only grabs him so hard, he wouldn't let him off. He wouldn't let my father could make a step without his head. And the end, the going to the grace, step by step, by the dark. My father armed me 
Det är sent. Jag menar. En maskin kan starta. Du. I fall down. I feel. I remember. He pushed me down. I fall him before him. I assume he fell down on me. I didn't see him falling down on me. But he was the closest down on me. On the nearest to me. Hardly on blood spilling. Seconds. And stopped quiet. That happened in September. Rosh Hashanah 1941. Now, he tells a very powerful story. And uh, unfortunately, the video does not go into detail on him climbing out of the pit and his survival after that. Um, what is also unique about this moment is that it's documented visually. Uh, unfortunately for the historical record, we have no video or photographs of the gas chambers in action. Um, the Nazis were very careful to keep that secret and to keep that secluded. We do have a few photographs that were smuggled out um, of Auschwitz taken by prisoners, but those photographs are sort of blurry and it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on. In this case, because the Einsatzgruppen are operating publicly, we do have photographs. The public took photographs, the soldiers took photographs, and in a rare instance, which you're going to see in this film, we even have video evidence of the Einsatzgruppen. number of photographs of the mass shootings because people take pictures of things that are of interest to them. They attended these executions and they took pictures the way people took pictures of lynchings in the South. Why did they take the pictures? On some level, they couldn't not take the pictures. It was powerful. It was attractive. It was meaningful. It was fascinating. And it was something that at least on a subliminal level they were proud of. And consequently, they wanted to document it for history. This film, which lasts less than two minutes, I think, was taken by an off-duty German military officer who attended this mass shooting uh, on the coast in Latvia in the latter part of June of 1941, or the very early part of July. The film is a remarkable document, if you will. Within its very brief time period, um, gives us access to all of the actors in this horrific drama. You have the victims, and you see that in this case, these are all men, some of whom have been beaten uh, before being conveyed to the execution site. And 
the shooters. These are uniformed SS and police personnel who are actually carrying out the shootings. Then you have another important actor in the drama, and that is the local auxiliaries who assisted the German SS and police in the shootings. These are the men with white armbands carrying probably their hunting rifles or their weapons that they used for their own purposes. Then, of course, you have the so-called bystanders, the witnesses, including children in short pants who are witnessing this really grotesque spectacle. And they're not witnessing anonymous people being shot. Uh, they're witnessing their neighbors, their teachers, their pharmacists, their physicians, uh, people with whom they've grown up, whom they looked up to, perhaps. Um, there's a kind of intimacy to the murders that is both incredibly unsettling but also a kind of grotesque nature to it. For me, the most chilling thing is that for the shooters, there's a kind of quotidian boredom to what they're doing in some cases. guy smoking, blowing out the smoke, um, evidence that this is a, um, a kind of routine, uh, in some cases, boring task that they're following through on. The most chilling set of frames in that for me is this pet dog that someone brings with them. the dog is startled by the by the rifle shots and darts across the frame a kind of reflexive reaction on the part of the animal to the shots who brought the dog there um, did the dog go back home with them what was the dog doing on on this scene when people were being being murdered I don't know why that moves me but it but it does problems with this killing operation that were problems not for the victims but that were problems for the perpetrator the first it was public the second was that it was too personal and then finally the problem with this was it was a waste of bullets Heinrich Himmler was horrified. He had found it easy to order other people to kill, but to be in the presence of people being shot in large numbers into a pit and to hear their screaming and moaning and see their writhing was more than he could stomach. And he started running around hysterically screaming, kill them quickly, kill them quickly. And this was just about the time when the decision came to move the Jews of Western Europe, which followed directly from the United States joining the war as the result of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. That's when Himmler said, okay, the gloves are off, basically. And they began to think about moving all the Jews of Western Europe. The 
real story is not the numbers killed, but all the Jews of town after town, village after village. It's Moshele and Shlomele, it's Hanala and Rivkele, it's Leila. It's family by family, person by person. One by one by one, bullet by bullet by bullet. The Einzone Gruppen had a problem, and not only was it hard for the murderers, um, the logistics of it was very difficult. Um, killing that many people is the easy part. Disposing of that many bodies is very difficult. Um, and really what they use in the end is the same sort of procedure we use to kill cattle and chickens and pigs. Uh, you don't send the butcher out to the field. You bring all the animals to the slaughterhouse and you mechanize it and you make it a machine. And that's exactly what the Nazis did. So the failure slash success mm -hmm. of the Einzon group in, in killing 2 million people then led to the death camps. Uh, the Einzon group and even experimented with gas vans to kill uh, quicker and more effectively. Um, as we continue through the course, we'll learn more about the death camps and how they operated.